to our worship at Christus Lutheran. So we will be following the order of worship as is printed in your bulletin or on the screen. We'll begin with hymn 697, May We Your Precepts Lord <coughs> and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I confess that I am sinful by nature and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord by singing him 940. Yeah. 
pray. Almighty God, look with favor on your humble servants and stretch out the right hand of your power to defend us against all our enemies. Bless us with your spirit that we might see the wisdom and power of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson is from the first chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, beginning with the 18th verse. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greek look, Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. These are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Invite the children up for the children's sermon. Hi. How are all of you today? You good? Yeah. So, what do we do when we come to church? Yeah. Praise God. Okay, anything else? <coughs> Learn about God. Learn about God? That's a good answer, too. What do we do when we do this? We pray. We pray, okay. So, Jesus went to the temple in our next reading. And he, he thought about being able to pray or sit and think about God. And when you pray, What's it normally like around you, as far as what you hear when you pray? Not much. Usually, nothing, no, hardly a sound at all. So, here's audience participation. I want you to imagine trying to pray to God and concentrate on it, okay? Maybe I'll go back. So if you're really wanting to watch a TV show and you want to pay attention to it, and somebody's being real loud and noisy, can you do that? You ever did your has your mom and dad ever been watching TV and they told you, Will you be quiet or watching TV? <laughs> did you ever say that to someone else? No? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So so think about that, and then think about trying to pray. So I need cows, I need lambs, I need goats, and I need doves, okay? And, I, and if we do a good job, I want them to imagine trying to pray when that's happening. So, you ready? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Think you can pray very good when that's happening? No. no. <laughs> so anyway, that's why that's why we sort of try to have it pretty quiet in church. But then there's other times where we don't mind it being a little a little loud so how when you sing for Sunday school in front of church does your teacher tell you to sing real softly or sing real loudly uh, loudly right and I know I know the song oh that's good <laughs> and you're, if you know them you can sing them loud so th that's a good time to be loud is when we're singing but sometimes when we're praying, we want to be pretty soft, okay? So that's what I want you to take home. So know those times when we in church can be, be a little louder or when we can be a little softer so people can pray. 
Okay? Usually that time is right before church. There's a time right before church when people are maybe sit down when they say a prayer to God, asking Him to bless their worship. Okay? So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was a great example. <laughs> sort of guess what our gospel lesson is from John <laughs> chapter 2. By the way, Jesus had to do it this twice. This is the first time. So when it was t almost time for the Jewish Passover, and this is probably the very first Jewish Passover after Jesus started his ministry, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found men <coughs> selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll continue with hymn 839, Rock of Ages. Jesus Christ. Amen.
The word of God for our consideration was our gospel lesson for this morning of Jesus cleansing the temple. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, my wife and I have been to Canada a number of times, although it wasn't any time recent. One of the, thing, the things you could always count on was that people in Canada, at least back then, would always take our American money because they would make an extra profit. On one of our trips, American dollars were worth 18% more than Canadian dollars. So some of the businesses had signs that if you used their, our American money, something uh, that would um, be a dollar in Canadian would be like 90 cents in, in, if we used American dollars. So the thing is, they would get the extra 8% for taking our American money. You know, in a sense, that's worse than the 5.5% sales tax that we pay when we buy any number of things. And back then, I think it's still in force if you go to Ontario, there's a 15% tax for foreigners. So, so you really get hit. You really feel ripped off. Sure, you could do currency exchanges and you get out of your car and you go over to the place at the border and you get Canadian money. And then when you come back, you change your Canadian money back into American, and you lose money there too. It's frustrating, but it's the price you had to pay if you were a tourist in Canada. But how, how about this? <clears throat> What if you came to church and you wanted to make your offering to the Lord and the church charged you a 10 to 12% transaction fee to exchange your money into church currency? That's what was going on in God's temple at Jerusalem during the days of Jesus. Now the Lord God in the Old Testament, so they were, so to do this, you were following God's law. He commanded that every adult Jewish male should come to him three times a year with his tithe and or his sacrifice. Those who came from far away were permitted to purchase an animal or purchase some grain for sacrifice. And you can find laws about that in Deuteronomy 14. It was reasonable and during the days of Jesus, um, they actually had shepherds between Jerusalem and Bethlehem five miles to the south. They had shepherds who were raising lambs for sacrifice so that they take the lambs up to the temple and there they would be sold for um, sacrifice and we would understand that people have to make their livelihood you know re doing that and we don't you know we don't mind that but um it could also get out of hand. In addition, each worshiper was also expected to pay an annual temple tax. And according to the rules, this had to be done in Jewish coin. Since Roman currency was the law of the land, of course there would be people in Jerusalem who were hired to exchange Roman currency for Jewish currency. And of course, they would make a good profit on that. Hence the money changers. Furthermore, God had commanded that only perfect animals without defect 
could be sacrificed at his temple. In fact, he chastised the people when they brought him animals with defects. By the way, this is why Jesus had to lead a perfect life to be the perfect lamb of sacrifice on the cross. So, you know, there's a connection between a perfect animal, you know, like a lamb for sacrifice and Jesus. And it was, it was the thing back then. So they had people who were judges if you brought your own. And these would be some of the most pickiest people you could ever find. That one's got a black spot on it. That's not correct. You've got to go buy one. And you can imagine, okay, you bring it to the temple and this is going, you know, so we got the animals making their noises. You got the money changers. You got people haggling over the cost of a lamb. You got people haggling over whether a lamb is perfect or not. Wow when you really think about it. Unfortunately for all these things, rather unreasonable profits were being made. And if this wasn't bad enough, it was happening right on temple grounds. And there were only 14 acres of temple grounds. I had a member with 20. And, you know, there's plenty of room, but this was Jerusalem, a major hub where everybody was coming to do their annual sacrifices, their major festivals like the Passover or, or uh, First Fruits or, or Thanksgiving, you know. Um, but the priests, they didn't just condone all this hullabaloo. They made a profit out of it. They got their cut. And then there was another problem. <laughs> I talked about with the kids, the noise. I don't know if you ever come to worship early and just sit and think. Uh, I know I've done it in my retirement where, you know, like about 10 minutes before church, you just go and sit and think, maybe say a prayer. Um, it happens here too. And every once in a while, us out there in the lobby can make enough noise where it's pretty good sound coming in here, right? And by the way, I'm guilty too. <laughs> it happened in Broadhead. I, my dad, when I grew up, he was buried in the in the in the um, pastor's office until right before. He never greeted anybody before church and. I made it a habit that I always greet people before church, and so I can get a little loud too, I guess. But imagine trying to worship and pray when all this haggling and all this animal noise, and you got people barking about the weight of a coin or whatever. So people come. This is supposed to be their opportunity each year to go and worship in Jerusalem. And all this hullabaloo is killing their worship. They were there for the cleansing of their sin. But the whole system made worship practically impossible and the system itself needed cleaning. <clears throat> so Jesus comes on the scene. Suddenly, Without warning, he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables to sold those who sold doves. He said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? We wonder how Jesus might have gotten away with that and not arrested or stopped. Well, I guess first there was the element of surprise. Probably no one had ever done this before, so they couldn't imagine it even happening. And Jesus may have had the backing of the common people who were there for the feast, seeing the money-hungry 
money changers getting their comeuppance as their money tables went wee <laughs> all over the place. We could almost imagine someone going, yay, you got them. <laughs> We suspect, though, that Jesus was very respected because of his words and his mannerisms, as he often was during his ministry. He commanded respect, and he usually received it. Today, you and I are Jesus' temple. In fact, anyone who is a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is a member of the Holy Christian Church and is God's temple. Is there anything that we do as individual believers or as God's visible church that is a hindrance to true worship? Now, I'm not speaking of churches that have to continually have public fundraisers like dinners or bingos to fund their church. That just normally shows a church whose members aren't probably giving properly properly to the Lord as they, as the Lord has given to them. But one of the ways might be the focus of a congregation. If the focus of a congregation is simply on the church building itself, making it as beautiful as possible or as user-friendly as possible, um, thinking that that will attract people to the Lord, then we're really focusing on the wrong thing. Well, there's nothing wrong with caring for the house of the Lord. Believe me, a shabby looking church is not good. The focus uh, of a congregation should always be on God's word and worship. We want to be worshiping regularly, building ourselves up in the word regularly, and by sharing the message of Jesus Christ as individuals, where we live, where we work. One final note, just a one word that Jesus used. Jesus refers to his father's house. What are you doing to my father's house? It reminds us of a time 18 years ago or so earlier when at the age of 12, Jesus was taken to the temple by his parents, Joseph and Mary. And then they started back and he wasn't there. When they found him, he said, why are, why are you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? As we might expect, the Jewish authorities came and demanded to know why Jesus did this. What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. So the temple that Jesus was worshiping in took 46 years to build with a crew that numbered 18,000 workers. It was a magnificent building and it actually wasn't fully completed until 64 AD, so that would be about 35 years later. It would actually be finally done. And then six years later, the Romans destroyed it. One stone was not left upon another. But it's no wonder the Jewish leaders were skeptical about Jesus being able to rebuild it in three days. But the Apostle John, using his writers, uh, I guess, looking back, he wrote about 50, 60 years after this. Uh, Jesus remind, John reminds that Jesus was talking about the temple of his body. And after Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples recognized the true meaning of his words. It's almost as if he was saying, Okay, I've interfered with your temple, but the day will come when you will interfere with mine, my temple, and will destroy the temple of my body, but I will raise my temple in three days. The raising of the temple of Jesus' body was not the sign they wanted, 
nor would accept, but it was one that was fulfilled through Jesus' resurrection on Easter Sunday. Now the disciples didn't get that at the time when Jesus said, raise it again in three days. They had no concept what Jesus was talking about, but the Jewish officials didn't. Don't you remember the Jews went to Pilate and they wanted the tomb sealed? Don't they were looking to kill Jesus from right here. Two and a half plus years before he actually died. They were looking to kill him because they knew exactly what he was talking about. So word got around about what Jesus had done. I'm going to share with you the verse immediately following the story. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. Yet the next verse says, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them for he knew all men. Jesus knew that the people were impressed only because of his miracles. They might have had faith, but it wasn't a dependable faith. Sure enough, two and a half years later, Jesus had to cleanse the temple all over again on Palm Sunday of all days. He said, there my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making a den of robbers. It's unfortunate that Jesus' words didn't have a lasting effect. Actually, Martin Luther commented about that. He said, if Jesus had not been crucified, he would have grieved to death over the utterly fu utter futility of his efforts with his people to teach them something. They just didn't learn. And we sort of share Jesus' feelings about not entrusting himself to the common people. We do our work, share God's word where we can. We hope that our, root, our words will take root in people's hearts, but we can't trust people. And I think that's what God's word was saying here. Um, you know, they, I think it's in our constitution that you're not allowed to be a church councilman for at least a year after you join because you know, you want to show a pattern of faithfulness there. We ran Bible camps for 10 years, and one of the purposes of it was to get kids to Sunday school. And almost every single year, I had a family, or maybe even two, that I thought, okay, let's work on them. Let's get their kids to Sunday school. And I had, yeah, we'll be there. And then so, first Sunday of Sunday school came, Mm -mm. You can't trust people. He, Jesus knew that. He knew all men. He knew people that welcomed him on Palm Sunday would turn on him and holler crucify him. The word of the Lord gets spread out and about. You know, we got that parable of the sower and the seed. God's word gets spread out. And some of that does take root. And we know it does take root because you and I are evidences of God's word taking root in people's hearts. And just as God's temple needed cleansing, so sometimes our temples need cleansing as well. In fact, we need it very regularly. And the Lord does so through the preaching of, and teaching of the word, which is happening right now. He does so through the confession of our sins, which happened a little bit ago. And he also cleanses us through the receiving of forget, his forgiveness as we receive Jesus' true body and blood in the sacrament, which will happen in just a few minutes. And this is something I look forward to the day will come when the Lord our God will totally cleanse us, body and soul, so that we will have no sin at all on Judgment Day when he will raise our vile, our sinful bodies, so that they will be fashioned like his glorious body, as Paul tells us. 
This could only happen because Jesus gave his body, shed his blood, paid for our sins with his perfect life and innocent death. And so we, may we praise him for that, now and forever. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us confess our faith and turn to the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in the love of Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. O Lord our God, you have brought us to, to your house and call us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We see our praise and hear our prayers, and we give to our peace. Lord of the Church, you led your ancient people by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Lead us through the wilderness of this world by your faithful pastors. That we might be refreshed by the living water that flows from the true side of our Lord Jesus. You have made us righteous through our Lord Jesus Christ and made us made peace with us by his cross. Lead us to carry our cross and faith as he shaped us to the workers in your kingdom and prepare us to be. Be with all our families to learn of you, live for you, and stand in your grace. Bless our nation that both citizens and authorities would seek justice, peace, and the common good of all. Give us confidence in the resurrection and the peace of a clean conscience as we come to your table to receive Jesus true body and blood, together with the bread and the Finally, dear Lord, we ask the blessing of your Holy Spirit to be with Pastor Timothy Kuski as he considers his call to our congregation to be our next pastor. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We join to pray the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He is mercy and goodness forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we will the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. We continue with our final hymn. that are around the church, uh, by, back by the pastor's office. Our, you can sign up for Easter lilies to put in front of our church for Easter Sunday. And also there's a sign up for Easter breakfast, and this year it's being held after our Easter worship. Um, that is by the ladies' restroom on that bulletin board. God's blessings. I invite you to Bible class and fellowship hour afterwards. Have a good day.